Welcome to this webinar, which will cover records relating to immigration and citizenship in Britain. The webinar will focus on modern sources, starting with the 1800s and concluding with the 1970s. Although many of the popular records are now available online to search and download, a significant proportion of the records are still available as original documents, but most of these records can now be searched by name on our online catalogue discovery, making research easier. There are many reasons why people move from one country to another, and these can be described broadly as push or pull factors. Push factors include instances where people have been forced out of a country. Examples include escaping political or religious persecution, or war, or economic hardship. Pull factors are positive aspects that attract people to move to a place. Examples here include good employment opportunities and religious and political tolerance. As my talk will indicate, migration usually happens as a result of a combination of these push and pull factors. To get started, you'll need to be aware of what may seem obvious, the names of the people you are searching for and where they came from. Remember, many immigrants anglicise their names to fit in with British society, so you may need to consider aliases they may have used. There are lots of societies that can help you with researching immigrant ancestors. For example, the Anglo-German Family History Society and the Jewish Genealogical Society of Great Britain. Some of these may charge an annual membership fee, but many also maintain a reference library. They also organise conferences, seminars and workshops, provide online discussion forums, publish genealogical guidebooks, journals and members' newsletters, as well as providing a general inquiry service. The National Archives website has a lot of tools that can help researchers get started. For example, there are separate research guides for passenger lists, immigration and citizenship records, refugees, internees and researching Jewish communities. Additionally, we have published books on the subject, such as Migration Records, a guide for family historians, and we have an extensive on-site library at Kew. Also, don't forget to explore the National Archives of the country your ancestors migrated from, as there also exist emigration records. I'm going to split the webinar into three sections. I'll start by looking at records relating to the physical arrival of people through sources like passenger lists and certificates of arrival. I'll then focus on immigrant waves and communities that were established. Finally, I'll focus on citizenship records these records can be extremely rich, but it's worth noting that the vast majority of immigrants settling in this country did not apply for British nationality, as it was expensive for most to do so. So, I will start in 1793 during the Napoleonic Wars, when there was the first system of aliens control at UK ports. You will note that I use the term alien throughout, and this may seem both archaic and disrespectful in modern times but it was the term used to describe non-British people as late as 1971, when the Immigration and Nationality Department of the Home Office was formed. Before then, the Aliens Office was an active part of the Home Office, and as such, our online catalogue discovery uses the term alien more so than immigrant to describe immigrants. Immigrants could also be British persons, and often were, especially Commonwealth migrants, come into the UK after the end of the Second World War. If you were interested in researching immigrants before the 18th century, you may also need to search using terms such as strangers and foreigners. Strangers in particular was a term used in the medieval and early modern periods. Most of our records reflect the legislation in force at the time. The Aliens Acts of 1793 and 1798 established a system of registration of aliens by means of declarations signed on arrival at UK ports of entry and certified into the Home Office by customs officers and local agents. Also, resident aliens and those arriving after 1793 had to give their names, occupations and addresses to justices of the peace. Surviving records of these can be found in local record offices among quarter session records. Also found there are returns of householders who took in alien lodgers. These are known as accounts of aliens and householders' notices and overseers' returns. 
The legislation stayed in force throughout the Napoleonic Wars, and the Aliens Act of 1816 further required masters of vessels landing in UK ports to declare in writing the number of aliens on board, specifying names and descriptions of all, and each alien was issued with a certificate of arrival. The Acts of 1826 and 1836 were directed mainly against foreign criminal and hostile persons and don't add much to our records, but by and large the requirements of these Acts remained in force until the Aliens Act of 1905. The earliest lists of aliens in the National Archives for this period can be found in FO83, an unusual series as these returns work their way back to the aliens office which was then part of the home office. There are two relevant pieces in, in FO83, pieces 21 and 22 for the years 1811 and 1812. The main series of certificates of arrival are in HO2 and returns of aliens passengers in HO3. HO5 is the name index to certificates in HO2 and there are some additional certificates in CUST 102. HO2 coverage is 1836 to 1852 only. Name indexes in HO5 survive from 1826 through to 1849. Information includes name, age, occupation, port of departure and arrival, and the signature of the alien. All of the records I've just mentioned are searchable by name on our partner site, ancestry.co.uk, where the records can be downloaded. You can see the example of both the Certificate of Arrival and Alien Passenger List entry for Friedrich Engels, a merchant from Prussia arriving in the Port of London in November 1842. Not all people were issued with Certificates of Arrival. Exceptions were merchant seamen, ambassadors and their domestic servants, and children under 14. However, merchant seamen, ambassadors and their domestic servants, and children under 14 should all appear on the list of aliens compiled and submitted by masters of vessels. These are in HO3 from 1836 through to 1869, with some gaps in the 1860s. The records include artists and composers such as Edouard Monet, Felix Mendelssohn, Chopin, who is described as a musical editor, and Francisca Liszt. There are some 650,000 names in total, and these can be searched and downloaded but not all were emigrants. Many were merchants and traders, or simply visiting. The majority came from France and Germany, though significant numbers came from the Italian states, Belgium, Holland, Switzerland, Spain and Austria. There are indeed gaps throughout the certificates in HO2 and the lists in HO3, and this was simply because aliens went through ports of arrival unchecked, especially during times of peace. In a select committee on laws affecting aliens in 1843, it was reported that in 1842 no lists were provided by masters and there were no registrations. In London, although an estimated 7,700 landed, only 4,500 were issued with certificates of arrival. This was one reason why lists and certificates after the 1850s and 1860s were not preserved as archives. Our main collection of passenger lists are those created by the Board of Trade and we have inbound passenger lists from 1878 through to 1960. These do not, however, include passengers picked up at European ports unless the ship's journey started from outside Europe and the Mediterranean area. Similar information to earlier lists, for example, names, age and occupation is included and also a UK proposed address field was introduced from the 1930s. So these lists are less good for tracing European immigrants, but better for tracing West Indian migrants after the Second World War, for example. The example shows the comedian Oliver Hardy arriving in Southampton on the 23rd of July 1932. His comic partner, Stan Laurel, is listed on a passenger list for British passengers as opposed to alien passengers. I'll now move on to looking at sources relating to settled immigrants. There are general sources looking at immigration policy and welfare. Cabinet minutes and memoranda discuss and shape immigration policy. The Home Office includes correspondence relating to immigration 
and the Ministry of Labour had a role for reskilling or training refugees, particularly after the Second World War. But we'll start this section by looking at records of the Metropolitan Police Force, specifically alien registration cards in the series NEPO 35. A wartime measure introduced in 1914 required aliens to register at police officers up and down the country, and this was the resulting record kept by the police. People would only come off the register if they died, left the UK, or became British. As you can see with the example relating to the Austrian architect, Ernst Freud, the cards are very rich in detail and include information relating to name, age, gender, marital status, address, occupation, together with a photograph and a signature. Some aliens stayed on the register for decades, such as bookmaker Joseph Corry, who, as you can see from the photographs, was of alien status from the age of 16 through to his mid-60s. Alien identity books were corresponding records which aliens were required to carry with them at all times. Aliens were subjected to fines if they didn't report any changes to their circumstances, and some aliens had continuation cards that recorded changes to occupations, marital status and addresses. We only have a very small sample, around 1,000, and they are searchable by name on digital download, but for those born less than 100 years ago, you need to search on discovery. Those for other constabularies may survive locally at police museums or in county archives. The status of aliens during wartime feature heavily in our records, as many would be rebranded enemy aliens during the First and Second World War. We have very little for the First World War. Much was destroyed under statute in the 1930s. There are lists of names of enemy aliens as assessed for internment, but who were not interned. These are specific HO45 and HO144 records, now digitised by Find My Past. Many records of interned people in the First World War survived locally, for example at the Isle of Man Heritage Centre, and much work has been carried out by the Anglo-German Family History Society. For the Second World War, we hold papers relating to the policy of internment, for individuals who were assessed for internment, for those interned, and for the camps in which they were interned in. Upon the declaration of war on the 3rd of September 1939, some 70,000 UK resident Germans and Austrians became classed as enemy aliens. By the 28th of September, the Aliens Department of the Home Office had set up internment tribunals throughout the country headed by government officials and local representatives to examine every UK registered enemy alien over the age of 16. The object was to divide the aliens into three categories. Category A meant that they were to be interned. Category B meant that they were exempt from internment, but subject to the restrictions decreed by the special order. And category C meant that they were to be both exempt from internment and restrictions. Some 120 tribunals were established, assigned to different regions of the United Kingdom. Many were established within London, where large numbers of Germans and Austrians resided. There were 11 set up in northwest London alone. The police were responsible for providing the details of the enemy aliens to the tribunals, as they kept registers of aliens, a requirement of the 1914 Aliens Registration Act, as discussed earlier. Arthur Wiedenfeld, the future publishing magnet, was a 20-year-old BBC foreign announcer in October 1939, and his card shows that he was placed into category C and exempt from internment. The reverse of his card notes that he is a Jewish refugee and doing rather useful work. By February 1940, nearly all the tribunals had completed their work assessing some 73,000 cases. The vast majority, some 66,000, of enemy aliens being classed as Category C. Most, but by no means all, of the 55,000 Jewish refugees who had come to the UK to escape Nazi persecution in the early and mid-1930s found themselves in Category C. You can search on findmypast.co.uk Category C cases where aliens were not interned. Some 6,700 were classified as Category B, and 569 individuals as Category A. Those classified in Category A were interned in camps being set up across the UK, 
the largest settlement of which was on the Isle of Man, though others were set up in and around Glasgow, Liverpool, Manchester, Bury, Sutton Coldfield, London, Kenton Park, Linfield, Seaton and Paynton. However, by May 1940, with the risk of German invasion high, regardless of their category classification, a further 8,000 German and Austrians resident in the southern strip of England found themselves interned. Resident Italians were also considered for internment following Italy's declaration of war on Britain on the 10th of June 1940. Internment tribunal cards are in the series HO396 and are all available to search and download on findmypast.co.uk. For those who were interned, the reverse of the cards, which may provide details of the actual internment, are closed for 85 years until 2032. Requests to access closed reverses can be made to the National Archives in writing, though in many cases the reverses are actually blank. As you can see with the card for German artist Eric Kahn, the cards provide details including name, date of birth, place of birth, occupation and details of employer. Initially exempt from internment, Kahn found himself interned in May 1940, so the reverse of his card remains closed. HO214 contains a very small sample of 87 personal files relating to individuals. Although these are searchable by name, the records have not been digitised, but there is a separate series of aliens personal files in HO405. These files relate to individual foreign citizens, mostly European, who arrived in the UK between 1934 and 1948 and who applied for naturalisation. As such, they include files relating to many of the Jewish refugees who fled Nazi Germany and found themselves interned. The file for Eric Kahn adds more to his story. It confirms he was interned under a general order of the Secretary of State in July 1940, but was released on the 23rd of February 1941 after representation had been made to the Home Office by the Artists' Refugees Committee. He had been rejected on medical grounds as unfit for service in the Pioneer Corps, a regiment often associated with released internees. The series HO405 has not been digitised and can be searched by surname and initials of forenames, and often by year of birth. The records in this series are closed for 100 years from the date of naturalisation, but under the Freedom of Information Act, you can ask for records to be reviewed and opened early though having a proof of death of the individual is rec recommended. HO213 and HO215 include correspondence and inspection of internment camps material. A small number of camp rolled call files can be searched and downloaded on findmypast.co.uk, but the vast majority of this series has not been digitised. Files range from internee camp policy, administration, together with files relating to camp inspections, discipline and complaints. For example, the record HO213-1052 relates to the inspection of women, children and married couples interned on the Isle of Man. Most internees were released before 1942, following the very controversial policy to ship internees overseas. With concerns over space to accommodate the growing number of internees, coupled with the suspicion that many of them were enemy agents, potentially helping to plan the invasion of Britain, a decision was taken in June 1940 to deport them overseas and many were transported to the dominions of Australia and Canada, including 2,500 internees who embarked on a journey to Australia on the 10th of July 1940 on the vessel HMT Dunirma. The group comprised a mixture of Jewish refugees, Nazi sympathisers and some 200 Italians. The Jewish refugees and Nazi sympathisers were classified simply as Germans and this caused resentment and conflict on the journey. The ship had a maximum capacity of 1,500 including the crew and the resulting conditions have been described as inhumane. The deportees were also subjected to ill-treatment and theft by the 309 poorly trained British guards on board. The 57-day voyage was also made under the risk of enemy attack. On arrival in Sydney, the first Australian on board was medical army officer Alan Frost. He was appalled 
and his subsequent report led to the court-martial of the army officer in charge, Lieutenant Colonel William Scott. Tragically, on the 2nd of July, 1940, another ship deporting internees overseas, the SS Arundora Star, was torpedoed and sunk in the Atlantic en route to Canada. On board were 734 Italians, 438 Germans, including both Nazi sympathisers and Jewish refugees, and 374 British seamen and soldiers. Over half lost their lives, including 470 Italians. It was this event that swayed public sympathy towards the enemy aliens. The release of 1,687 enemy aliens was authorised in August 1940, and by October, about 5,000 Germans, Austrians and Italians had been released following the publication of the Under Secretary of the Home Office, Osbert Peake's white paper, Civilian and Internees of Enemy Nationality. The paper identified categories of persons who could be eligible for release. By December, 8,000 internees had been released, leaving some 19,000 still interned in camps in Britain, Canada and Australia. Of the released, some 1,273 were men who applied to join the Pioneer Corps. They would be joined by internees in Canada and Australia, but here the process of release would take longer. By March 1941, 12,500 internees had been released, rising to over 17,500 in August. By 1942, fewer than 5,000 remained interned, mainly on the Isle of Man. And so to the final part of this webinar, looking at records where aliens apply to become British citizens. The 1844 Naturalisation Act empowered the Home Secretary to grant naturalisation. Before then, the process was quite complex. Naturalisation required a separate private act of Parliament. Even though it was simplified, it was still relatively expensive and the majority of aliens settling in the country did not go through this formality. We know that there are over a quarter of a million individuals who received naturalisation between 1844 and 1980, and these can be searched by name on Discovery. There are two types of naturalisation record. The memorial, this is the application for naturalisation together with witness statements and police reports, and the duplicate Home Office copy of the certificate that was issued to the successful candidate. As mentioned earlier, it was a very complex and expensive process before 1844. You could achieve some form of British nationality by a private act of Parliament which conferred full rights, or by applying to the Crown for letters patent which conferred some limited rights including the right to own but not to inherit land. But most aliens did not bother. In 1844 the process was simplified by empowering the Home Secretary to grant naturalisations as they do so today. But there were qualifications in order for you to apply. Firstly, you had to have lived in the UK for at least five years. Secondly, you needed to identify five references of British nationality to vouch for your character and respectability and to verify details including residential addresses. Finally, you needed to state a reason for wanting to become British and you had to demonstrate a good knowledge of English, written and oral. From 1873, applications were reviewed by local police constabularies and the police report often determined the outcome of the case. Naturalisations helped to make permanent somebody's presence in the UK. It also allows you to vote and to take public office. Looking at memorials first, there are four separate series of interest. H01 contained memorial papers for naturalisations that took place between 1844 and 1871. These can be searched and downloaded on Discovery. The series H045 consists of memorial papers for naturalisations issued between 1872 and 1878, and the series H0144 includes memorial papers for naturalisations issued between 1879 and 1934. None of these records have been digitised, and for naturalisation records issued less than 100 years ago, these records are mainly closed, though you can request for the file to be reviewed. This also applies for those personal files in HO405, which include naturalisations after 1934. 
Up until 1934, the vast majority of naturalisation memorial papers survive, but from 1934, there is about a 40% chance of finding a naturalisation file, and most of these relate to European subjects who migrated to the UK between 1934 and 1948. There are additional alien files in the series HO382, but again, the 100-year closure rule applies, as the files are very detailed and sometimes include MI5 reports. Details of all those who successfully naturalised were presented before Parliament and published in parliamentary papers. All of these details were added to discovery, which allow us to search by name, country of origin, place of residence from 1878. Though for both HO382 and HO405, it's only often possible to search by surname and initials of forenames. On screen we see part of the memorial for a Michael Marx in 1879. His resident referee declaration is signed by his British business partner, Thomas Spencer. In accordance with the requirements, Marx had to provide proof that he had lived in the UK for at least five years. Both would form the giant retail outlet, Marx and Spencer. Applications had to be vouched by police constabularies or the mayor after 1872. Here we have endorsement of Marx's case by the mayor of Wigan. Sadly for philosopher Karl Marx in 1874, the Metropolitan Police condemned his application, noting that he is the notorious German agitator, the head of the International Society and an advocate of communistic principles. This man has not been loyal to his own king and country. It is very unusual for us to have unsuccessful applications, though they are sometimes included in files that ultimately record a successful case. The HO405 file relating to artist and former internee Eric Kahn provides a fascinating read. He eventually became British in 1959, but his personnel file records previous unsuccessful attempts, which include reference to him being part of a German cultural movement which was viewed suspiciously by MI5. As well as the memorial cases, the National Archives hold in excess of a quarter of a million duplicate Home Office naturalisation certificates issued between 1870 and 1980. They can be searched by full name on Discovery. You can also search by nationality and city or town of residence from 1878. Our partner site, ancestry.co.uk, have digitised records for naturalisations that took place between 1870 and 1916. As you will see, we have the duplicate certificate issued to Philip Mountbatten in 1947, who would later become the Duke of Edinburgh and consort to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. All of the naturalisation certificates in the series HO334 are open, and they tend to summarise the details in the memorials, providing information relating to full name, place and date of birth and occupation, as well as details relating to parentage and spouse and children. The series HO334 also holds hundreds of thousands of registrations of British nationality in the UK, which relate to Commonwealth workers who came to the UK after the end of the Second World War, and to alien women who married British men after 1949. It also contains tens of thousands of renunciations of British nationality and certificates of renaturalisation of British women who had lost their British nationality upon marriage to an alien husband. The vast majority of these records can only be searched by number and date of certificate, but you should be able to search by full name on discovery, providing the subject was born more than 100 years ago, or who we know is deceased. The records are fully open, and we have a contact form on our website where you can request details of individual records we have not yet fully catalogued. On screen you can see the registration for Frederick Bulsara, also known as Freddie Mercury. There was no compulsion to register your British nationality, but many did so after the colonies they came from became independent, and you needed to do so in order to hold a British passport. There is so much to cover in this webinar. I've tried to identify the major sources, but we have others relating to specific waves of 20th century migrants who, for the main, didn't settle. These include First World War Belgian refugees in the series MH8, Czechoslovakian refugees who came to the UK in the late 1930s in series HO294, 
and specific series relating to Polish refugees and resettlement in the UK after the end of the Second World War in the series ED128. Also, don't forget census records which often record individuals as BNS, indicating British naturalised subjects. But a word of warning, this did not prove the individuals were actually British, but it's what the household has declared for whatever reason. In many cases, we know the reality was that they did not become British. I hope this webinar gives you a flavour of some of the rich sources we hold. Good luck with your research.